Anyway, uh, uh, hello everyone. This is Rick Nelson, owner of the Annapolis uh, Sailing School, uh, here to uh, introduce the second edition of, of the Allure of, of Sailing, or perhaps uh, better called uh, Seriously Fun. In fact, we'll be even more serious and perhaps more fun <laughs> taking off these uh, uh, glasses and their reflection. Uh, but uh, today, uh, we're going to uh, meet and have a presentation from Sam uh, Hackstein and uh, Annapolis to Australia, um, uh, a great trip. Now, uh, just a, a quick update in terms of uh, the sailing school and, and speaking of fun, but um, we uh, are open now for Cuba Club members to take uh, uh, boats out and uh, also for the general public qualified sailors for Rainbow 24 uh, rentals. So uh, give us a call, check out the website for updates, but um, things are uh, opening up and, and uh, it's, a, it's a happy occurrence. Um, just in terms of, of, of uh, Sam and the, the, the trip, uh, Sam and a number of uh, people close to the Annapolis Sailing School in terms of instructors and leaders here, Fred Probst, uh, Andrew Moe and others uh, took Graham Lee, who was also an instructor here, took his 50-foot uh, uh, Sparkman Stevens uh, pilot house boat, the Swanee, uh, from Annapolis through the Panama Canal across the Pacific uh, to Australia, an incredible uh, trip. Um, I think a fun note, Sparkman and Stevens, uh, while making epic boats uh, such as the Swanee, also made the uh, the uh, legendary boat. <laughs> they designed the, uh, the Rainbow 24. And so a um, uh, nice uh, bit of lineage in terms of tying it together. And again, the Annapolis Sailing School family and some of the fun things that uh, they're doing. Um, so uh, I'll turn it over uh, shortly to Sam, just a, a couple of administrative notes. We will be uh, recording this. So if uh, people don't want to be part of uh, any um, public uh, uh, reproduction of this, then they should um, stay off in terms of the, uh, the, the video. Um, but uh, we will be posting this, as I suggested. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, we did uh, Karen Rory uh, Finneran's uh, trip from um, uh, Gibraltar uh, to uh, the Caribbean, and that's posted. And uh, if you look out in another two weeks, we'll be hosting uh, yet another edition of uh, the series of uh, This time, um, we believe that uh, we'll be going over navigation and John Cosby, but uh, look out for the posting and uh, the actual topic uh, time again, 1 p.m. on Saturday. Um, in terms of uh, the talk, probably 45 minutes, uh, Q&A is encouraged at the end of the talk, and you can do that either by uh, typing in the chat line or um, you can uh, also unmute and then ask uh, Sam a question uh, directly. Uh, so with that, if you would put yourself on mute and then um, uh, sit back on this beautiful day and, and hear uh, Sam uh, tell us about his trip. Sam? Thanks, Rick. Um, I didn't know John was doing a, another seminar a couple weeks from now. He usually does a, a pretty great um, navigation seminar. I know he's, he's always well known for that. I appreciate you guys putting this together as well. Um, you guys do a lot of great stuff to add content for, for the Kilbo Club members, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to be a part of that. Uh, the sailing school for me was really where I got my start in sailing. Um, I had been sailing recreationally before that, but it wasn't until someone there picked me up and brought me on as an instructor that, um, that they really started grooming to be, be such a great sailor. Um, I know some of you guys may have been on this um, seminar before, I'm looking through, I see a couple of familiar names. Um, so I'm going to try to bring some new content for you guys that are, that are first time to the, the seminar um, and for you guys that, are, that have been seen, been seen it before. Um, what I'm going to cover with this, we sailed a long way, but it, it's not just about the sailing. Um, so I'm going to try to cover some of the preparation, um, what it takes to become a sailor who can do this kind of trip, what it takes to get the boat ready. Um, and I'm also going to cover things that we learned, things that I didn't know before the trip that, that I do know now. Um, lessons learned the hard way, in other terms. Uh, questions, as Rick said, please, um, I've tried to be as comprehensive as I can, but please write down your questions and feel free to ask them afterwards or maybe some things that I, that I left out or skipped over. 
Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. Why we did the trip. Um, it was for these kids here. So Graham is, as Rick mentioned, uh, was an instructor at the sailing school, but he was, uh, he was part of the Australian military. And so that's what had him in the United States. Um, but he had to bring his family home eventually. Um, and he wanted this boat. And the reason being is that Swanee is a very special boat. Um, as Rick mentioned it, Swanee was built by Sparksman Stevens. Um, and it was built during a time when they were building boats like no others, just like the rainbows, they're, they're indestructible. Uh, so it's a thick fiberglass, the boat's going to last a lifetime. Um, Swanee has incredible uh, sailing abilities, but you'll also notice that she has a, a modified full keel, uh, which you'll see there in the picture on the left, which makes her stable, but it's not a full keel, which makes her slow. So it, it's just got a great balance um, of performance and family cruising. And it was an absolute dream to sail. So I can understand why he didn't want to sell her. Um, Swanee, it, it, she's got a lot of room down below. There was a, uh, I, a main cabin in the back, two bunk beds for kids, and then a V-berth, um, which you see in common boats now, but the two bunks isn't as common, um, which his, his kids loved. Um, the, real, the real story, though, was the, the football. You see the, the kid on the left there had a, a little blue football on Swanee, and we joked that uh, the whole time we were bringing Swanee across for, for his football, and it was actually the very first thing uh, when he got on the boat, he went looking for the football. He didn't care too much about the boat. He just wanted the little blue football. Um, so, so like I said, the preparation of this trip was really a large part of it. It was four months of preparation to do four and a half months of sailing. And if you talk to anybody who's owned a boat, they say it might be two to one, two hours of, of work on the boat or maintenance on the boat to get one hour of sailing out of it. Um, and, and that was, I mean, we got lucky to do four months to, to four and a half months. Um, when you're, when you're prepping for a trip like this, um, if you think about what it takes just to go sailing for a day on the bay, what kind of stuff are you using to get ready? You check the weather, you check your safety equipment. Um, it, the, the nice thing is, is when you're at the sailing school and it's what makes the sailing school such a great place to learn is that you have so many resources at your disposal. When you go out, if, if you didn't check the weather, there's always someone in the office that's, that's watching for thunderstorms or if you run aground because you didn't know the charts very well, there's, there's someone there that's going to come tow you off. The difference is, is when, when you go for a blue water trip, you're not only away from maintenance shops or experts that can help you fix the boat or, or come get you a sea tow if you run aground, things like that. You're, you're away from Google, you're away from YouTube. There, there is no way to get information when you're out there, um, or at least it's, it's very minimal information. So, so how do you approach a trip like this? Well, what, what we did was we sat down on the boat and we play the game we play as kids. You know, you know, you know your parents and you say, well, what if this? Well, what if this? And, and it's, it sounds kind of silly, but you sit on the boat and say, well, what if the sails break? Or, or what if the engine doesn't start? Or what if the mast comes down? Or what if we get into a storm? What if the boat sinks? And, and you play this what if game until you identify all the things that you really need to have prepared for the trip. Um, the, the larger part of it was education though. So we played the what if game, we identified what, what do we need to fix? What do we um, need to repair? What do we need to have ready? But a large part of it was also education. Um, that's the part of the, what you see there in the background there is part of the list that we put together and that was pages long. I mean, you can see it's 48, 49 um, different slides there. But, but like I said, education was a big part of it. And these are some of the resources that we use that, that you might be able to use as well if you're gonna plan a trip like this. Um, the world cruising routes helped us to identify what the best way to navigate um, through where to sail. And what I didn't notice is, or what was a surprise to me is if you look on um, the page that I've copied here, our trip from, from Norfolk or the Chesapeake Bay, right here, instead of going in a direct line, which might be the shortest route, you have to come out and go down. And, and the reason for that is, is, is the winds. Um, which you can see over here. This is from, um, what's the name of the organization? The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, and, and they show what direction the wind comes from, how fast the wind speed is in each month, and, and just the different weather patterns that show up, waves, all of that. There's also Noon Sight. Uh, Noon Sight is a, a cruiser's blog. It's the ultimate cruiser's blog, though. They have all of the information that you need to check in and out of um, different ports, where you can anchor, where you can't anchor. 
you know, things like that in Annapolis can, can be common sense. You know the area, but when you're going on a long trip like this and you're going to go to different countries and you're going to go to different areas, the weather is different. Um, the fronts move differently. There's different ports that you can or can't go into. Um, each country has different currency, obviously, but there's, you know, where, how accessible is it to get to a bank to attain that currency? Do you need to get it beforehand? What documents do you need to print out beforehand? Um, noon site was very helpful for that. Again, the pilot charts, um, you can download for each section of the ocean. They tell you where the weather is going to be. That was very helpful. And then world cruising routes really does a lot of that work for you, um, where you can see, you know, you got a lot of headwinds here, so you're going to want to come out. And then you got a lot of, uh, of easterly winds over here, so you come out and go down. Well, instead of analyzing this and your boat's polars and the way your boat sails, you can look at the world cruising routes. Um, this book's about sixty dollars, but it, it has the different routes all across um, all across the country. The easiest way to go through, um, what part of the islands to cross through, things like that. So, uh, our, our trip was pretty long. Um, we left from Annapolis to to Beaufort. Then our next stop was supposed to be Panama and then all the way over. So you can get an idea with this chart down here, what we did. Um, it, it was hard to draw that map on anything other than Google Maps because I couldn't zoom out far enough. Uh, but hopefully that gives you an idea. Um, how do I turn this off? I'm stuck on my slide. There we go. Oh, it didn't take my, uh, my notes off. Hold on. There we go. So part of getting the boat ready outside of just the education and preparing for the countries that we were going to go to was going through each of the systems on the boat. Um, and, and you might think that it, it's kind of simple. There's some sails and there's an engine, but there's so much more to that. Um, there's the standing rigging and the running rigging, there's the blocks, there's the lines, that, that there's, there's so much that goes into sailing. So part of what we had to do was just put our hands on each of the systems, take them apart and put them back together. So this was one example. We took apart all of the winches. Um, so this is the internal of a winch. It's a little bit larger um, than what you're used to seeing at the sailing school. Uh, but you got the gears and the bearings and all of that needed to be um, looked at, make sure there wasn't rust, make sure that um, the gears here weren't going to corrode and start slipping. It, winches are very important in sailing. We use them uh, and, and everything from pulling up an anchor to um, obviously pulling the sails in. I mean, they're just, they're essential on a boat. So if, if one or two of those went down, it really would have been uh, troublesome. There was actually six different winches in the cockpit and then three more up on the mast or four more up on the mast. And they all had a purpose and we were using all of them at several points during the trip. So taking apart the winches, but really the knowledge goes beyond that. I mean, it's the diesel. Um, I know very little about diesels. So before we did this trip, we hired a diesel mechanic. He came over to Swanee specifically and he took apart um, the engine in front of us and he said, this is the thing that's gonna break. This is what you need to look out for or listen for. Um, if you see this coloration of steam or smoke coming out of your exhaust, you know, this is important. And, and that's something we didn't know. And we wouldn't be able to troubleshoot out in the ocean. You can't Google white steam coming out of the back of my boat. Um, so, so he went over the engine with us. Um, we went up the rig several times to inspect all of the standing rigging. Um, is there any weak spots in the, in the shrouds, in the stays? Um, you're looking for frayed wires, things like that. It's if your mass comes down, you don't have enough fuel to, to get you where you're going in the ocean. So it's very important that the mass stays up, obviously. Um, and, and so inspecting the standing rigging was a huge job. Water tanks. Um, we required, we had 280 gallons of water, which was a lot, but there was no way we could store enough drinking water on the boat without those tanks. So we can't bring gallon jugs on the boat. So we had to rely on those tanks for our drinking water. And those tanks can get moldy. So what we had to do was, was go into the tanks through the inspection ports with a sponge in our arm all the way down the bilge of the boat, reaching down there, scrubbing those with, with bleach, rinsing them out, flushing them, um, all of that. The life raft. The life, there was a life raft on the boat. Um, we didn't know when it had been purchased or when the last time it was serviced. And you actually need to have life rafts serviced on a regular basis. I believe it's every, uh, every five years. And so we took this life raft into a professional um, in Baltimore and they took the life raft apart. 
that some life rafts come with uh, food and water inside and that food and water goes bad. So they replace that food and water. Some of them have CO2 um, to inflate the life raft automatically. Those tanisters need to be changed out and replaced. So very important, we had a life raft serviced uh, auto and main bilge pumps. Um, the, the auto bilge pump was working okay, but the, um, the main bilge pump was, uh, sorry, the, the manual bilge pump was not. Manual bilge pump, if you ever look in the cockpit of a boat, it'll, it'll be a little, um, a little hatch cover with a, with a hole inside. You stick a, uh, a rod in there and pump it up and down. It's a manual bilge pump. That wasn't pumping, so we had to rerun the wires for that to find the problem, the, the wires, the, the hoses for that to find the problem, and, and replace those hoses. Uh, through hulls or seacocks, um, anywhere your boat brings water in or puts water out, a lot of times through bilge pumps, sink drains, uh, heads, they have through hulls. Very important to map those out. So we had to find each one of our through hulls. We had to open it up. Um, we had to make sure that it worked, open, closed, and, and some of them didn't. Uh, fortunately, we only had to replace one through haul, but that's taking a whole lot of the boat and putting another uh, through haul back in. It's, it's fiberglass, it's, it's a lot of sealant. But if one of those through haul failed during the trip, I mean, it, a bilge pump would have a lot of trouble keeping up with that with the amount of water it let in. So servicing and checking your through hauls was very important. Um, the EPIRB for the boat, obviously, is an emergency locating beacon, uh, uses satellites to send an emergency signal out. We were pretty far out in the Pacific, so it would have been tough to get help in a reasonable amount of time, but it's very important that, that you have that EPIRB so that people know where you are and make sure that EPIRB works. So. Um, each of those have a battery life stamp on them so you know how long they're good for. They have test buttons, make green light, red light, you know. So, so checking your EPIRB was important. Um, mapping out, so I'm going to circle back to the through hauls. Mapping out where each one of your through hauls is. If your boat's taking on water, you need to figure out where it's taking on water quickly. Um, so we had a little uh, a schematic where we drew each of the through hauls on the boat um, to help us identify if water was coming in, where it was coming in from. Um, <laughs> And despite all of those, those things that we checked and repaired while we had access to Google, YouTube, and experts, uh, we still had a number of problems out on the water, which, which I'll get to, um, which I'll get to when we cover, when we cover uh, the, the trip itself. Uh, preparation for the boat is just separate from personal preparation, so there's a lot of personal gear that you need to make a trip like this. Um, life jackets are obvious, but a lot of people will skimp on the life jacket because they're so expensive. And when I say life jacket, I don't just mean the life jacket you see up here at the top. Part of having an offshore life jacket is a tether. It's a personal uh, locator beacon, a PLB, um, very similar to an EPIRB. It sends off an emergency signal to a satellite with your location. Um, again, in the ocean, that can be kind of hard to find. You can be really far away. If you're in the ocean, it's very important for your boat to be able to find you as well. So having an AIS uh, man overboard beacon as well, um, that is something that when you go in the water, some of them are automatic, some of them are self-armed, you can pull and it will send a man overboard beacon to all vessels in the area that have an AIS system. Um, an AIS system is an automated identification system. Um, I believe that's the, what the acronym stands for. Essentially it shows you where all ships in the area are. Every container ship has one. Most blue water cruising vessels have one. And um, that is something that we added to our boat as part of what we were doing. Um, we added a transmitting and receiving uh, AIS system. It's important that other vessels know where you are. While we stood watch 24 hours a day, um, some sailing vessels don't. Um, and, and it's important for container ships to see a long way out. So, so it's just an added layer of protection, an added layer of safety for, for that AIS. But it also means that when you go in the water, someone will be able to find you from your own boat. When you're 4,000 miles out in the ocean, the Coast Guard is not coming to get you. So the, the PLB is, is the personal locator beacon here on the, on the side is not as, as important as having this AIS. And on top of that, having a, having a knife. So all of these need to be a part of what's on your life vest. And, and this equipment alone will cost you $1,000 or more. And so people go, oh, well, no, I don't want to spend that kind of money. Well, if you're not going to spend that kind of money, you shouldn't be going offshore because without these, you're putting yourself at a lot of risk. Yes, there's a Coast Guard when you're coastal, but it, they're not gonna be fast enough. It, it's very important that A, you don't fall off the boat. Um, if you do fall off the boat, it's important that they can find you, uh, find you quickly. Um, two things I'd like to note about the, the knife um, and, and the tether. You'll notice that this tether has a quick release here. Some don't, some of them are carabiner styles. 
Um, what's important about this is that this, um, where it attaches to your life vest, will release under pressure. So if, if you fall off the boat and you're getting dragged by the boat and there's nobody there to help pull you back on, if you just continue to let yourself get dragged by the boat, it's a very real possibility that you can drown. So it's important to try to stay attached to the boat so that they can pull you back on. But if you fall off and they can't pull you back on, you have to release yourself. And so it's important to have this quick release um, under tension. Um, and I can't remember the name of the shackle right now. Um, but it's important to have that. So it, it's a little bit more expensive, but again, it's, it's essential. Don't, don't skimp on this kind of safety equipment. Um, the knife, you can get any old knife and you can sharpen it to the best of your ability, but there is a certain point where you need a quality knife. Um, when we were sailing for four and a half months, when you're sailing for longer distances and you don't have the option to replace your knife, you need one that won't rust. Um, when the blade's rusting, you know, it's not going to be as sharp. And it is essential that, especially if you don't have this quick release shackle here, that you're able to cut your tether. Or we had a situation where, and I'll get into more detail, where I had to cut a halyard. Um, we had a situation where we were attached to another boat. Again, I'll go into more detail later. And we had to cut the line that was attaching us to the other boat. Um, and all of those had to be an instant. You know, you don't have time to run to your table down below to grab the knife. So that, that knife has to be attached to you at all times, very important. Um, so that's all part of the personal preparation. On top of just your life vest, though, there's foul weather gear. There's jacket, there's um, bibs, there's, there's for different temperatures, there's insulated, there's shells. And, and in certain situations, you live in, this, you live in this apparel for 24 hours or more. Um, we were going through a storm. I had to wear my life vest, my uh, tether, all, all of this equipment, my foul weather gear, my boots, um, for, for 24 hours because it's pouring down rain, the, the, the water's coming over the side, you're getting wet, you need to have your safety equipment on, and if you bought something cheap, you're not going to be comfortable in it, you're going to want to take it off. And if you're taking it off, then there's no point in buying it at all. So there's a lot that goes into personal preparation. Um, flashlights, I went through four flashlights, perfectly good, I wouldn't blame the brand, it's just that the parts of them were, that they corroded inside. So. Um, very important to, to invest in quality personal equipment. Um, you really won't, won't go wrong with that. A addition to the boats, like I said, we, we added an AIS. We added a lot more. Um, what you're seeing here is a, a monitor, it's a, it's a wind vane. This is an autopilot system that's driven by the wind. You won't see this a lot in, um, you won't see this a lot in coastal uh, or, or even the Chesapeake Bay because it requires consistent wind. But the great thing about this is that it does not require any power. So what you see here is you set this to a specific wind angle. We all know a close haul sailing position is, is 45 degrees. So I'll, I'll use that as an example. You set this up 45 degrees to your boat so that this top part, um, this top part here is, is parallel with the wind. And if your vessel strays off course, this gets blown one side or the other. And what that does is it turns this, this rudder down here and then that rudder is no longer parallel with the current. So it has force on it either this way or the other way. And that adds um, input to the tiller and it'll self-correct. So it's a very simple system. There's no, there's no technology, there's no power. It, it's easy to fix, it's great. Um, I would never do a long-term blue water sailing trip without a wind vane steering system, without a wind vane autopilot. Um, once we got this figured out, which it was a little bit of a learning curve, once we got this figured out, hand steering for this trip, I would say I personally did less than 10 hours of hand steering in a four and a half month trip. We use this monitor wind vane almost all the time, even in storms, even in winds over 20 knots. This guy was an incredibly um, accurate. It sailed a straighter line than any of us on the boat could. Um, absolutely awesome. But again, it requires a consistent wind input. Places like the Chesapeake Bay, um, where you're going to be tacking a lot or, or you don't have consistent winds. Um, it's not so great. And, and I'll show you an example of that when we get later into the trip. Um, other things that we added um, outside of that, we added solar panels. Uh, power is important. We tried to minimize our power use, but we did have a fridge freezer. Um, we were running navigation system, lights, all of that draws power. So we used two solar panels on the top um, for that. There's other options for, for power on a, on a on a cruising vessel, you see a lot of people use wind. Um, we chose not to use uh, a wind turbine because we were gonna be sailing a lot in the trade winds. Um, and in the trade winds, when you're going downwind, the apparent wind or the amount of wind that the boat will feel it is not as much. 
Um, and, and so we used, uh, we used solar. There's also um, hydropower. It's a new thing. It's a, there's a Watton C, I think is a more common name. And it's, uh, it's something you attach to your transom. It's a little propeller. It spins in the water while you're underway. Um, we, we chose not to use that because it's not going to be as useful to the owner when he gets it. If he's sitting in port a lot or if he's at anchor a lot, he's not going to be making power there. So we chose solar. We went with solar. It's good to have redundancy. I would you know, suggest if you were making a, a liveaboard for yourself or a long-term cruiser for yourself um, to maybe consider wind or, or hydro as well as in addition to solar. It's just good to have those backups. Um, wind power is also prone to, to breaking a lot more than solar, which obviously sits still. It doesn't have moving parts. It's a little bit better. Um, again, like I mentioned, the IAS transmit and receive was very important for us to have. Um, and we had a lot of other stuff on board. The AIS was already, AIS was already on board, and so was the, the life raft. Um, boat had a lot of storage for fuel, so we didn't need to add a lot of uh, external fuel carrying. Uh, I think we had 300 gallons of fuel in our tank. Um, it had a lot of water. Like I said, I think it was 280. So we didn't have to add too much, uh, too much else for that. So those were the big projects. We did have to add those. Um, the other big one was a, a single sideband radio. Um, a single sideband radio is what allowed us to communicate with the outside world when we were underway. Um, next slide. Um, so what we were able to do with the single sideband radio was download NOAA weather forecasts um, on a daily basis through, through grid files. So what a single sideband radio is, is an older technology, but it allows you to get radio transmissions from a lot farther away. Um, when you're out of range of VHF, it's it, it's I'm not going to go to the, the technical side of it. I don't really understand it. But when we were out in the middle of the Pacific, we were still able to get single sideband radio transmissions, and we were able to download weather on a regular basis. We also had an Iridium Go, um, which is a satellite uh, hotspot, so it uses a satellite uh, to download internet. And we're able to put this onto a tablet, um, not your iPad, not a typical tablet. We use the like Gatak tablet, which is it's more like a very high tech computer, um, but it, it it's just a little bit different, a little bit better for boats. Um, and we used a number of different uh, programs uh, through that tablet. Um, one of them was Commander's Weather Forecasting. Um, so Commander's Weather Forecasting came through the single sideband radio via email. Uh, the email is sent through Sail Mail, which is a different service that um, really converts single sideband radio transmissions into email. Um, it's essentially a Morse code. <laughs> it's dots and dashes that they send through radio transmission signals that, that come out into um, legible emails. So Commander's Weather would, uh, they monitored our trip the whole time as a service we paid for. Um, we were able to download it through the single sideband radio. They monitored our position. They did a lot of dead reckoning. They said, okay, you know you're going between Turks and Caicos and Panama. You've been underway for X number of days. Your average speed so far has been X speed. And they would tell us, hey, you guys have a front coming in. You need to sail this way. Um, so that was really a great peace of mind that we had um, on board. But, but like you can see, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. There's a lot of learning that we have to do. We had to learn how to use a single sideband radio. It's not as easy as pushing a button and calling. You have to tune into a certain frequency, set a distance. There's weather and atmosphere interference, and you have to be able to do it for all of that. So I drove out to West Virginia um, to take a school with the um, University of West Virginia, or I don't I can't remember the name of it, about single sideband radios. Um, and, and that's how we were able to get weather on board. Food. We did most of our food stock up, canned condiments, things like that, things that would store here in Annapolis. That's the, uh, the Sam's Club that's right here in Annapolis. We loaded up a car to the brim with, um, you'll see ramen noodles, that pack of ramen noodles on the top lasted us all the way to Australia. Cheez-Its, it's important to have comfort food when you're out there. Um, Chef Boyardee, you know, all the common, uh, common foods, but also things like canned chicken. Again, that canned chicken that we bought there lasted us almost all the way to Australia. Um, tuna, obviously, is a pretty common canned meat. Uh, but a lot of that was backups. We also plan to, um, to replenish on the, the fruits and vegetables and meats in the different ports that we were going to. So what were the different ports of call that we went to? The first was Annapolis, Annapolis to Beaufort. This was important. We, we didn't want to go to Annapolis to Turks and Caicos or Annapolis to Bahamas or Annapolis to, to Panama because we wanted an initial uh, shakedown cruise. So if you're going to make a blue water trip, it's important to, to set up a shakedown cruise yourself. The Chesapeake Bay is absolutely perfect for learning. Um, it gives you a, a, an environment. You, you still get waves, you still get wind, you still get weather, but you're able to pull off at any time and, and go to, to, 
to get help. So Annapolis to Beaufort was our first run. Um, that allowed us to get accurate, up-to-date weather information around Hatteras. Um, if, you, if you've heard anything about Hatteras, it is uh, a nightmare to cross in bad weather. You get current and wind that mix, and it creates waves and chop. Um, and, and I'll get in a little bit more to that next on the next leg. So we were able to round Hatteras to Beaufort, um, and that was a good shakedown cruise for us. Nothing too much broke, but we saw where we needed to do a little extra work on the boat. Um, and when we got to Beaufort, unfortunately, we had to wait for an, our next weather window. Um, we sat in Beaufort for over a week waiting for a weather window. Uh, the reason being is crossing the Gulf Stream is an absolute nightmare, and you need perfect weather to do it. Um, not perfect, but it, we had a lot of fronts coming through. When you're near, when you're near a, continent, a continent, it, it sets off different weather patterns. You get a lot of fast-moving fronts. So we waited in Beaufort for over a week for a clear weather window to cross the Gulf Stream. Um, it was a bit of a pain. Beaufort is uh, surprisingly where I learned a decent amount about anchoring. Uh, where we anchored in Beaufort had a strong uh, switching current. Uh, and, and so we tried here, which you see in the picture in the bottom there is a fore and aft anchor. Um, you'll read about those in your ASA 103 or 104 courses. They talk about different anchoring methods. But the fore and aft method was so that we wouldn't swing too much. It was a very narrow anchorage. Um, and so we didn't have a lot of swing room. We didn't have a lot of draft. Obviously, Swanee is a big boat. Um, so we had this fore and aft anchor set up. The, the current was too strong when you combined it with the winds. Um, the fore and aft anchor didn't end up working. We had to use a, a Bahamian moor, um, which I'll go into a little more detail uh, towards the end of, of things I learned. Uh, that was a, <laughs> an experience and a half. The, the current switched in a, a strong in the middle of the night. We were up at uh, 12 o'clock. Andrew Mo was there with us and... Uh, Oof, it was a nightmare. There was a storm, it, it, bad, bad situations. It was very important to use the right type of anchoring style. Um, and we were anchor, anchored up there for a while, so we, we got a good bit of experience with that. The trip down the bay was mostly power. We didn't have a lot of wind, um, which was good for rounding Hatteras, but, but it was just a three-day trip. It's usually about 24 hours to get out of the bay. Um, so Beaufort to Panama. That was the next leg of the trip. I have almost up there because we didn't quite make it. <laughs> so... Uh, the ocean's unpredictable. The boat's unpredictable. We did everything we could to prepare the boat for a blue water crossing. Uh, unfortunately, we had a number of things that broke that it was enough for us to um, to terminate the original destination of Panama and, and go for a bailout point, which was uh, Turks and Caicos. Um, jumping the Gulf Stream. I have never been seasick until I went to cross the Gulf Stream. Um, even, even though we waited for over a week for a good weather window, um, the waves were just so confused. The motion of the boat wasn't right. Um, and I, while I didn't, I didn't get to the point of, of throwing up, I didn't really get to the full seasickness. It's a feeling of disorientation when you're down below. It's a feeling of, it's almost like you've had too much to drink, um, right before, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's nasty. Um, and the Gulf Stream is just that way because of the current and the, the wind and they just get choppy. Um, like you can see in the photo here on the left, we did uh, follow the World Cruising Routes Guide. Um, we went out east and then we went south, and that was just so that we could get better trade winds and get away from, um, get away from the coast where you have a lot of unpredictable weather, a lot of unpredictable uh, wind, and, and you also have the Gulf Stream that runs up the coast here on the left. So, so we got out, we went down south. Unfortunately, right about point three or four on the side there, we started having some more problems. Um, the starter motor for the engine, uh, started to go out. So every time we started the motor for charging the batteries or for you no know, wind, the start was getting slower. And, and so we knew there was a problem coming. Um, so, so that was on our, on our mind. Also, the mechanical autopilot broke. Uh, we were underway. I believe Andrew Moe was on the helm. On the helm, he was just monitoring everything, monitoring the, uh, the wind. And it was just too much wave action. So the, the uh, mechanical autopilot actually where it was welded together, the well just sheared apart. Um, which is amazing to see the force that's put on those autopilots when you have sheared metal. Uh, so the mechanical autopilot broke. Luckily, we had the servo pendulum steering. Unfortunately, this was the first real test we had for it, um, the first time we had consistent enough winds. And so the servo pendulum wasn't quite calibrated right. And, and like I said, it, it's a pretty simple system. You know, there's no, um, there's no mechanics involved with it. But where these lines cross the boat, where these lines cross the boat, it's very common to get chafing if it's not set up right. So our servo pendulum had a lot of issues with chafing and the lines were actually chafing through. So without an autopilot, it's all hand steering. Um, that was a mess. The starter motor was going down. So we decided to take a stop in Turks and Caicos. Uh, we were able to replace the starter motor and it ended up being a wire that was corroded through that ended up shorting out the starter motor. 
it's something the diesel mechanic didn't catch. You can't catch everything, but we were able to identify what the problem was, order the part ourselves, because the, the help in Turks and Caicos, it's not the same as here in America. So um, that's what broke Beaufort to Panama almost. To, stopped in Turks and Caicos, really wasn't too bad. Turks and Caicos beaches are, are pretty nice. Um, we ended up staying at Turks and Caicos for about a week while we waited for that part, installed it ourselves, uh, troubleshot a little bit, got it going. Um, we were on our way. Turks and Caicos to Panama, it was 890 miles, about six days, and it was probably the most enjoyable sailing I've ever had. The wind was consistent. The waves in the Caribbean are, are pretty tame. Uh, the weather got a lot nicer. It wasn't cold. We left in April, so the first part of the sail was a little bit chilly. Um, and this was also our best time. It was uh, six days. We, we averaged a, a great speed. What you see on the left there is our AIS as we come into Panama. Panama is, as you can imagine, one of the busiest um, commercial shipping areas in, in the world, just because so many people bottleneck up into that spot to cross through from the Atlantic Caribbean into the Pacific. So all those dots you can see there are container ships, um, some of them anchored, some of them underway, and it was a bit of a nightmare to, to get into Panama. Um, this is also when the fishing started getting good and we started learning more, which you see there in the bottom right is a barracuda. Um, so those things have some pretty nasty teeth. I wouldn't mess with those. Panama. Panama was uh, a nightmare and a half. We got to Panama uh, the, at the end of April there, as you see at the top, we're at 430. And it took us 15 days before we were allowed to transit the canal. The reason being is uh, the Panama Canal, you have to be there before you can schedule your transit because they have to inspect the boat. They inspect the length, the width, despite what the boat specifications are, they come on and, and actually measure it. You have to get permits. They always want their money. Everybody wants their money. Um, and so it, it took us, we, you know, we got in on the, the 30th, but it, it took us 15 days before we were actually allowed to transit the canal. Um, the canal transit process, you have to hire an expert who comes on with you um, and he shows you, you know, what, what the whole process is. And you also, you can hire line handlers. Um, you have four different lines that are, are coming to your boat from the size of the canal so that they can control where your boat is in the lock. Um, we used this 15 days as efficiently as we possibly could, although um, it was a lot of sitting around. We repaired our spinnaker. We had one that had started to tear during the, the um, Turks and Caicos to Panama. We repaired the mainsail. There was just some, some tearing, some fraying. You know, it's just preparation, making it stronger, beefing it up. Uh, the fuel filter, the boat hadn't been used a lot before we'd gotten on. We'd run about a full tank of fuel through it at this point, uh, maybe about half a tank. And so the fuel filter was getting pretty gunked up. Um, sediment, um, algae, different things can grow in your fuel tank. And when you run the boat, when the boat gets sh shaken up, that kind of stuff comes out. It gets sucked into the fuel lines. Um, that is almost always where we have issues with the diesel. Very important to have a good fuel filter and know where it is and know how to replace it. That was something the diesel mechanic had showed us and, and taught us. Um, engine bolts, the engine bolts were shaken up a little bit. They were getting loose. The engine was getting loose. Um, and we replaced the halyard. There's a lot of chafing that goes on with, um, with long-term sailing. So we just went up the mast. We checked everything. We saw the halyard was shaping a little bit. We tried to be preventative about it. Get on top of it before it actually breaks. Breaking underway, which we had, and I think I'll get to in the, in the next slide or two, um, is a pain in the butt. Going up the mast in the ocean is a pain, and I'd have to thank uh, Captain Ben Ferrar. He was the, the lightest person on the boat, so he got selected for, for that job going up the mast, and uh, I would not have wanted to do that myself. So um, replace the halyard and trying to prevent that kind of stuff. We eventually did get to transit the Panama. So what you see there in the picture on the left, we went up our first lock. Um, it, it's amazing to see the amount of water they move with the amount of, the amount of um, capacity in these, these container ships and these small sailing vessels. So what you'll see what they did with us, because we're small, they don't want to give a full slot to one single sailing boat. We'll often combine other sailing boats together to go through at one time. And so they make you raft up. Um, they put you in with the container ships and they back those container ships up within uh, 15, 20 feet. I mean, less than a boat length. It is terrifying. Luckily, it's not those container ships under power. They don't have that type of maneuverability. Um, you'll see that they have lines actually uh, attached to those container ships. If you look on the, the left and right side running to shore, we had the same thing. Um, they take you up the locks, up the locks into the, the top of the Panama Canal is actually a lake. Um, and you are on your own through the lake. And then you go to the next side and they bring you down the locks. Um, it's incredible. They, they close you in a box and they fill it up or they empty it with water and you go up and down the, the different elevations. Um, we did have an issue and this was one of the situations where I, I was so glad I had a knife on me. When we got to the other side of the lock into the lake, we had experienced some wave chop from the, the pilot boats and the other boats that were running around and our boat started coming together and falling apart in that chop. 
defenders were there to protect our holes, but it was too much. And one of the lines actually snapped. And at that point, we started coming apart like a zipper and the back of our boat started to, to come together where there weren't fenders. And so it was one of those split second things where if you had to go down below to get your knife, you would have caused a lot of damage to the boat. Um, I was able to cut the, cut the line with a knife and we were able to go free. Uh, no damage was done to either boat. Fortunately, it was a very nice boat tied up. It was a brand new Ocean, it's 50 or something. Very nice boat. Glad we didn't do any damage. Uh, Swanee would have been fine. Like I said, Sparksman and Steven, six fiberglass. She's a tank, but uh, didn't want to do any damage to the other boat. Panama Canal was very interesting, but once we were through the Panama Canal, the next uh, stop was the Marquesas Islands. Um, the Marquesas Islands are part of French Polynesia, uh, French Polynesia, Tahiti, Bora Bora. Uh, it's part of that island chain. It's a uh, chain. It's French speaking primarily, but uh, the Marquesas Islands still have a bit of native, native language that, that they speak. Um, it was the longest trip. Um, it was about 4,000 nautical miles. And again, you'll see we didn't go in a straight line. So we didn't keep our, um, we didn't keep our, our navigation instruments on the whole time. Uh, which is why you see these dots, you know, that was just us checking in on the GPS chart plotter. We used our phones. Um, Navionics is actually an app that you can download on your phone. Each of the captains, myself, Fred and Ben, um, we each had Navionics on our phones. So we were checking that on a regular basis. Um, we didn't need the boat's chart plotter, but you can see what we did here. And I, and I turned this map so it would be north-south oriented. Out of Panama, we sailed almost due south in order to catch the trade winds or at least reduce our amount of time in, in this area here. Uh, which is, is the doldrums. Uh, there's just not a lot of wind. It requires a lot of motor. So this was very slow. Uh, we crossed the equator just outside of Ecuador here. Um, on my birthday, on May 29th, we crossed the, crossed the equator, which was pretty fun. Um, we did our, our sacrifice to Neptune, uh, which coincided with our first broken part of the trip and a very sad part. We lost our fridge uh, just before we crossed the equator. So all the fresh food that we had packed or purchased in Panama, the meats, uh, the vegetables, they all had to be eaten or thrown overboard. So Neptune got a, uh, got a great gift of all of, our, all of our spoiled meat that we could no longer eat as we, uh, as we crossed the equator. Um, after that, you know, it's, it was about 30, that's 31 days of sailing. Um, and that kind of sailing, it's a lot of chafe, it's a lot of... Um, the same motion over and over again, even though it's little and you try to listen to everything and you try to see, you know, what's going to break. It's a lot of chafe. And we actually, um, the boom bang where it connected to the mast. Uh, so the boom bang connects, uh, the mast to the, uh, to the boom, the boom bang where it connected to the boom, excuse me, uh, broke off. Um, the bolts, the, the metal just sheared right off. And that's just constant, um, constant little motion that eventually got to the boom bang. I mean, pieces of metal. So, we had to take that apart underway and put that back together. Very important to have a boom bang. Um, again, if you sail with rainbows, you can loosen your boom bang and see what happens when you're going downwind. Um, the main sail becomes very unsteady. Uh, it's, it's, it's essential to have that. So that was a, we had to do that underway. Um, we blew up a spinnaker on this trip. Uh, just two strong winds. The spinnaker was a little bit weak. It was an older spinnaker. It was rotted out a little bit. We kind of anticipated it. Yeah, something we were, we were looking at back in Annapolis. It wasn't worth having a new one made. We just figured we'd use it until it blew. It finally blew across in the Pacific. Um, the traveler system, uh, controlling the boom is, especially Swanee's boom, was very important. Swanee had a, a roller furling mainsail. And instead of rolling into the mast like you have on the Benetos, it rolled into the boom. And so the boom was a very heavy part of the, the system. So um, we had lines tied to the boom. We had the um, boom bang working to keep that boom still. Um, but on uh, one of the jives where those, those were um, unattached and during some heavier weather, um, the traveler ended up where the, the line attaches to the traveler. The block system there actually exploded. Um, and we also had the stay sail chain plate. So if you look at Swanee, uh, and I think I have another picture of it later, it had a, a jib, which is the one that runs all the way to the front, and it also had a stay sail which is a, a jib that runs between the mast and the, the Genoa or the, the very front. Um, that chain plate where the, the sail connected to the, the deck of the boat had actually started to rip up out of the hole, out of the deck of the boat. Um, and again, it's just repeated constant motion um, that had that happen. So we, we had to fix that, unfortunately, or fortunately not underway. We ended up fixing that when we got to land. It wasn't really essential for us to have that stay sail. Um, on that crossing specifically. So a lot of items broke. The fridge uh, obviously was probably the biggest one of this whole trip. More importantly, no more cold beer. <laughs> um, but
but uh, we were able to make do, uh, and we found that the uh, the ocean was actually the best grocery store out there. We didn't really need the fresh meats. Um, the Pacific, especially in the tropic area, was absolutely plentiful um, with with the amount of fish. When we were crossing by the um, Galapagos Islands, we were catching four or five mahi a day. Um, and the mahi, the dolphins, which you see there in the left picture, and and we'd we'd reel them in, we'd look at the size and decide whether we were hungry or whether that was the right size, and, and throw them back because an hour or two later we'd be able to catch another one. Um, I would say this is one area we didn't do enough preparation for knowledge. We didn't really know how to fillet the different fish out there. Mahi versus tuna, um, it's a very different fish to to cut up. Um, so you'll see here on the top right that the mahi gets cut into two. It's filleted, very good fish. Um, whereas the, the tuna um, here gets cut into quarters. So there's a bone that runs down the, uh, the middle, um, kind of like an X on the tuna. So you had to cut that differently. But tuna, mahi, very plentiful. And we also reeled in a uh, blue marlin. It was probably seven, eight feet. Um, you see Ben there. He's a six foot guy-ish, something like that. And that, that marlin was definitely a little bit bigger than him. So um, that was crazy. We, did, we fought him for probably about an hour, um, brought him alongside the boat and, and tail roped him. Again, this is something I didn't know. This was, we didn't know very much about fishing on this first leg. Um, you're not supposed to tail rope a blue marlin. It's very bad for them. Um, it can actually jeopardize their life. So that was something I learned afterwards. Please don't do it. We were not going to eat this marlin. We had no way to store the fish, other the meat. Um, we, we let him go. Hopefully he's okay. But again, don't, don't follow the example here. This, this was a mistake. Um, we also caught, almost caught a, uh, a, if you ever watched the show Wicked Tuna, uh, those blue fed tuna, they're very big, 200 pound, 300 pound tuna. Um, we had one of those up next to the boat, but we had uh, a lot of trouble trying to get it onto the boat. And again, we weren't going to eat it anyway. So the line had ended up snapping in the press is getting on the boat. Glad to have them go free, uh, live another day for somebody else to catch. So pl plenty of fish out there. It's one of the smaller tuna. Tuna is very good. Once we finally got our stuff together, we were able to get creative with it. I mean, we had a lot of fish out there. Um, I would say we really didn't, didn't miss the fridge too much outside of the cold beer. Um, we got sushi there. We've got, um, ahi tuna. We were, the mahi made great sandwiches and made great tacos. Um, we finally got across the, got across the Pacific, the 31 days to the Marquesas Island. Clear this, um, clear this, these markings off here. Clear all drawings. The Marquesas Islands were beautiful. Um, the anchorage that we uh, chose was probably two or three miles from the main town. We were able to restock on food. We really didn't mind the walk. It would have been nice to have bikes, but having bikes would have meant that you had less room, less storage in the boat, more crowded. So pros and cons to everything. Um, our case sounds beautiful. We walked two or three miles to the town, got checked in. Um, the French Polynesian Islands are very difficult customs and immigration wise. Um, so we actually hired a, a company that helped us uh, process the paperwork to check in and check out of French Polynesia. Um, Took a little bit of time in, in the Marquesas Islands, a, a very beautiful island chain, um, to just recoup. And then we sailed from the Marquesas Islands to uh, Tahiti. One of the other interesting parts about the Marquesas Islands is all of their food comes in by ship. Um, and what you see here is on the right side picture, that's Swanee. And this little X here to the land and off our bow is part of a range marker. Range markers are, are two marks on land that have to be lined up and they draw a line out of the ocean. You'll see a lot of them in in like the port of Baltimore and they tell ships where the center of the channel is. In this case, and it was something that we had learned through the noon site, um, that, that, uh, that website that I showed earlier, the range marks actually mark the edge of where you could anchor the boat. Um, and so we came in, we anchored right on the edge of that line. And it was really good we did because the supply ship came in the next day. And I am not kidding when I say that supply ship left less than a boat length between us and him. Big container ship as he came in. You know, they have the, the system perfectly. They drop an anchor, they pivot in, and they do a great job, but you really had to be behind that line. There was a boat that wasn't. They sent a little uh, a dinghy out. They made him move. He didn't have an engine work, and they were like, I don't care. They pulled his anchor up and just let him drift back into the anchors because they could not stop the container ship that was coming in. So very important, preparation. Read the noon site. Read about the Marquesas Islands. Read about this anchorage, and you'll know not to anchor in front of that, uh, in front of that line. Pulling up uh, our anchor in the Marquesas Islands, I had something that had never happened to me before. Um, we had a rock on the anchor, uh, an entire rock stuck on the anchor. So it was pretty weird. The, the um, windlass was really complaining, really whining, had to give it a lot of uh, extra tugs. We finally got it up. 
Um, there was a rock on there. I'm going to go over pulling up the anchor a little bit more because we had, uh, had some more, more learning to do um, on this trip. We also found a pretty cool waterfall. It was nice to have fresh water um, underway. We, we had 280 gallons. That's enough for, for drinking, for cooking. Um, you really don't push it. We filled up our water in, um, in Panama, and we had to sail 31 days to the Marquesas Islands. Not a great place to fill up water in the Marquesas. So we had another six days to Tahiti. We didn't get water for almost 40 days. So underway, there, there wasn't a lot of water for showers. Uh, so we were very thankful we got to this. We found this, uh, this waterfall, fresh water, clean water. Um, that was nice to, to really just douse yourself in, in clean, fresh water. Um, Marquesas Tea, like I said, six days, 820 miles. You sailed through the Tumotu Islands, absolutely beautiful island chain. Um, and if you look closely in the bottom of that picture there, you'll see Tahiti off in the distance, um, kind of faint. Nothing broke on that trip. Uh, the Marquesas to Tahiti, luckily, uh, that, was, that was great. Um, we fixed the, another halyard. Uh, we did an oil change in the boat, very important to, to keep the, the engine running. Um, replaced a uh, fresh water hose. It had just been kind of dripping into the, to the hull. Um, we had, what we've been doing, we noticed the, the drip on the trip uh, across from, from Panama. That's uh, so what we've been doing. It's just turning off the fresh water pump so that that line wouldn't stay pressurized so that the, the water wouldn't leak out. We turn the pressure on um, when we needed, we needed water and turn it back off. So we were able to replace that hose. Tahiti was really the first place we were able to get good parts after Panama. You know, there, there's not a lot of parts, there's a lot of stores in, in the Marquesas Islands. Um, we fixed the stay sail chain plate here. Obviously that was a big job. We needed some tools, we needed some parts, so we did that. Um, the coolant uh, for the engine that's, uh, that's coming up, that, that broke during our time in Tahiti. Um, we also did some repairs on the mainsail there. We had uh, so a problem with the, the luff of the mainsail where it connects into the mast. Uh, just had to stitch, stitch that back together uh, so that it would run a little smoother. But uh, this is uh, Morea. Um, Morea was a, an island just off of Tahiti. We'd anchored there before leaving for Bora Bora. Uh, and when we pulled up anchor, and, and you know, they always say to check your systems before you leave. But when we pulled up anchor, we started motoring out. Uh, about five minutes out of the anchorage as we had a, a high temperature alarm. Our coolant hose had actually exploded. It was coolant leaking all over the, the uh, bilge of the engine room. Had to turn around, uh, get back on anchor as quick as possible so we could shut the motor off, it wouldn't overheat. Um, we had to get parts over from Tahiti uh, to, to replace that coolant hose. So, I mean, it, it was awesome that we had the skills to do that. That was part of the preparation. That was part of the diesel mechanic showing us what goes where and how it all works. Uh, Bora Bora is as beautiful as they say it is. Um, I would say the Marquesas takes the takes the the trophy for the most beautiful, just not as inhabited, not as touristy. Um, but this was really where you see the pros and cons of a, a large cruising vessel for a long term trip. It was great to have Swanee it, it being such a big stable vessel for those ocean crossings. Um, but when we got into uh, Bora Bora, we wanted to do a little more exploring around the island. Again, it's a, it was a delivery. We were getting paid to get the boat from point A to point B. We didn't have a lot of time. Um, but going around the island of Bora Bora, Swanee drew a lot of water and, and the channels were very narrow, which you can see here on the top right picture is uh, that's, we were in the middle of a channel. We had five or 10 feet to that marker and that marker was like two feet of water. So you're, you're really limited if you have a larger cruising vessel when you get to these places. So if you do a larger cruising vessel, it's great. You're going to have the living space, but you're going to want a better, um, a better dinghy or exploration boat to, to really get around these islands. Um, Bora Bora is really, it's the end of, of, um, of French Polynesia. Uh, so we checked out there, but it's also the end of the um, trade winds for the most part. Everything starts getting a little bit more shifty uh, past that. So Bora Bora to Tonga. Um, Tonga is uh, a pretty cool island chain. I'll get to that in the next slide. It's about 1,200 miles. It took us 10 days. Um, we did blow up a spinnaker. What you can see on the left here is our GPS track over a, I think a 15 mile period, 20 mile period. And you notice these the curves in it. Um, that's actually from the change of the wind direction constantly. Um, and we were under the, the servo pendulum um, steering system. So as we were sailing, we were constantly having to adjust that servo pendulum to try to keep up with the changing winds. Um, absolute pain in the butt, lots of squalls. Uh, and that's how we blew the spinnaker up. We had a very good spinnaker up. Um, older, but it, it was a solid spinnaker. The winds were light, five to 10 knots, one person on deck. Um, we had a spinnaker going so that we could actually get some forward momentum. Um, and, and within a few minutes, you know, I saw one of those squalls on the horizon. I called the crew up, um, wake everybody up, pain in the butt. Uh, you wake everybody up. But by the time I had seen the squall coming our direction, by the time everybody got up on deck, we were all prepared to take the spinnaker down. 
the wind was gusting up to, to 25, 30 knots, and it actually just blew the spinnaker apart um, before we had time to, to get it down. So, you know, it, it's crazy once you get out of the trade winds how quickly things can change. Um, maybe don't use a spinnaker when you're light-handed. Maybe you have two or three people on deck at all times, but that just really wasn't an option with us. Um, we had a three-person crew doing three-hour watch shifts, three on, six off. Uh, you really needed those six off to sleep, to eat, to clean your clothes. Uh, laundry was done in a bucket, so, you know, it's not quick to clean your clothes. Um, it sucks to wake people up, but in this situation, we just didn't get people up soon enough. We didn't have enough people on deck to be running a spinnaker. Uh, we blew the spinnaker up. Tonga, Tonga is the weirdest place I'd ever been. Um, the, the rock formations, everything was very weird. Um, underwater caves, the whales, it was very weird. We came in on uh, Saturday night, something we read on noon site, the entire island closes down on Sunday. There is no fishing, there is no swimming, there is no purchase of food, everything is closed because they're very religious there. Um, Tonga was one of the only island chains that had never, chains that had never been conquered by a, a, a European power. Um, they were originally cannibals that at some point they found religion um, and they went very hard as other churches. They closed completely on Sunday. Uh, we got in Saturday night, there was nothing we could do to check in. Uh, we had to wait until, until Monday morning to check in. Um, Tonga to Australia, 1,300 miles, 18 days, um, coming close to a major continent again. We had some more disruptive weather. Um, at this point, we, we didn't have a good bailout option. We had to sail through it. Um, winds got up in the 40, 40 knot range. Um, waves were, were 15, 16 feet. Um, and that was one of the situations where I did live in my, um, in my gear, my foul weather gear for a long period of time. Um, this, what you see here on the bottom is a radar screen. So the boat did have a radar. Good for looking and seeing other vessels on the horizon, but also capable of, of locating rainstorm. So we use this radar here to track the motion of the storm and try to go through at the smallest point. Um, it, it was it was a nightmare, but we, we got through. You reef the sails, um, and, and you you just do everything you can to secure everything on deck, everything below deck, and a lot of caffeine. Um, but we did get through it. Um, Tonga to Australia, we had one broken halyard. Um, the halyard was actually it broke right at the end of the trip. We were sailing um, into uh, into uh, the, the very last leg, five miles from from port. Uh, we went to take the spinnaker down, um, and it would not come down because the uh, winch had developed an override, so there was a knot on the winch. Couldn't get the winch off, so I had to cut the halyard in order to get it down. Again, another one of those situations where the knife had to be had to be right there, that the spinnaker had to come down and it had to come down. Um, we got through, we got it down, got into port. Um, beautiful, beautiful weather after the storm. The East Australian current is uh, the current similar to the Gulf Stream that runs off the uh, Eastern coast of Australia. Um, very uh, full of life, lots of dolphins. We saw uh, bioluminescent water with the water that glows. The biggest issue is whales. Um, which you see there is a whale tail. We were sailing along middle of the day. Uh, luckily, all of us were up. It was a beautiful day. It was getting a little colder, and we started to hear a, a flapping sound. And we thought it might have been the sails that was slowly locking our bangs. So we started looking all over the boat, looking underneath, you know, what's that sound? You're always paying attention to sounds. But it wasn't until we got uh, 15 feet from these, we looked over the bow, and we saw all these whale tails doing just what they're doing there, smacking the water. They were angry that we were coming towards them. Um, and, and while surprising a whale would win in a fight with, with a boat, even a Sparksman and Stevens boat, I, I will admit the whale is going to win. Um, so whales were terrifying. That was my biggest fear when we got uh, close to Australia. They could surface underneath the boat. They can fall on top of the boat. Terrifying. Um, what we learned. So we got into Australia. What we learned, and I cannot believe it took us this long to learn it, what you see here in the top left is uh, called a twizzle rig. And a twizzle rig is where you run two head sails off of the bow in separate directions. What we were doing in most of the trip is wing on wing or dead downwind sailing, a lot of just trade wind sailing. And with that, you have the main sail out on one side and the jib out on the other. If you guys have the chance, practice in the rainbows. Um, very difficult to learn, but it's an, an important skill to have. Um, the problem with wing on wing is the two forces are on different parts of the boat. And so the boat develops a huge role. You could not leave anything down uh, on a counter. It would just roll off. Even though you're downwind, even though the boat's not heeled over in one direction, it was just constantly rolling side to side. And that's because of the two different pressure points, the bow and the center of the boat. Um, what the twizzle rig does is it puts all of that on the front of the boat. It essentially is like a spinnaker, a little bit different, super stable, amazingly fast, 
Um, in our situation, we had a specific sale for it. We didn't really know how to use it the whole trip, um, but we finally figured it out at the end. Twizzle rig, there's some YouTube videos on it. Definitely look into it. Um, absolutely great for, for long distance sailing. Um, repairs underway, which you see here, the, the next picture to the right, um, that's Captain Fred. He's repairing the, uh, he's repairing the, 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 the bang on the boom. Um, lessons learned, the, it's not a great force at once, but just a constant repetitive force that can really do the damage on the boat. It does not matter how good of a sailor you are. Things are still gonna break when you're underway. Um, it, and you have to be able to repair them underway. Cooking um, underway is not easy. Um, you might think, you know, it's good to give the crew a boost, cook a nice meal, cook a fancy meal, uh, which you can see there. And I don't know if, the, if your cameras are in the way, but cooking was oftentimes a big mess. There's not a lot of room on the stove. We had eggs spill all over the place. Um, fishing, again, we did not know enough about fishing on board. Um, it was great to get uh, to, to learn underway, but a lot of fishing gear, the ocean's going to provide a ton of food. Um, so that's the best place to, to really get your food. Um, the Bahamian moors, what you see um, in a diagram down here at the bottom, the Bahamian moors where both anchors run off the bow. Um, this is what we needed to do in Bofor. This is what we finally did at the end. It does have a little bit more swing room, swing radius than the fore and aft, um, but it allows the boat to kind of pivot on its bow. Um, one of the modified Bahamian moors that we learned after is that you can attach a block down here. You can attach a block down here in the center um, and it helps to add holding power so that this anchor runs through the block. And when the boat pulls on it, it pulls the anchors in the right direction so that you get an added holding power. So look up Bahamian moors, definitely know how to do them. Switching currents, switching winds, very important. Um, that last picture there is that the boat leaned all the way over on its side. Uh, and that was where you see the, the stoves kind of rocking back and forth there in the picture above it. Um, cooking underway, not easy. Some other things on top of this, it's very, very, very important that you get along with the crew that you're sailing with. Um, we spent a lot of time in a very close proximity and, and, and it's very important to know who you're sailing with, what their skills are. It's great to have a diverse set of skills. Fred had a lot of experience with boat maintenance. Um, ben had a lot of experience with boat building. He's a fiberglass guy. I had a lot of experience with sailing, not to say more than the other guys, but, but we balanced each other's skills out well in that fashion. Everybody has to have a positive attitude when they're out underway. It, it's super hard. There's a lot of up and ups and downs when things break, when there's no wind, when it's hot, when you can't shower, when the, the food kind of sucks, when the fridge breaks, you're going to go through low points. Um, very important to, to be able to maintain that positive attitude throughout the trip. And that's a characteristic trait of some people and some people just don't have it. So very important to know who you're sailing uh, across an ocean with. If you're going to hire a captain to maybe teach you how to do blue water sailing, you want to do an owner assisted delivery where you got a captain on board, know your captain because maybe do a day sail with them before because if you guys don't get along or don't mesh well or don't have the same idea about sailing, it's not going to go very well. Um, the, the last thing is really that I thought I knew a lot about sailing before I left this trip. I had been with the Annapolis Sailing School as an instructor for four or five years. I had uh, raced competitively in college. I had spent my whole life pretty much sailing. Um, and, and I just realized how little I actually knew until I got out of the ocean. Um, it's not just about, you know, how to sail efficiently. It's about all the systems on a boat, all of the, the winches, all of the, the, the diesel parts, the, the autopilot, the electronics. The, there's just so much to know about sailing. There's never an end to the learning. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You do, it's just a, a sport that, that you're going to always be learning something in. Um, and you just have to go about it with, with people that, that you trust. Um, and, and if you can surround yourself with people who, who know more or who are smarter about the topic than, than you are. Um, that's really all I have, guys. If you want to ask questions, I think, uh, Rick, uh, you had a, a way to do that. Um, we did get to all sail your straight uh, safely. Um, it was a great trip. We learned a lot. Um, and, and I hope I didn't, didn't miss too much here or skip too much, but open it up to questions. Yes, if, if people have questions, uh, whether uh, some may have been uh, typed into uh, the chat, or Sam, you might look at that, but otherwise, uh, people can just take themselves off of mute and then uh, ask Sam a question directly. I do see some quiet. What was the cost to transit the canal? That is, I'm not confident on this, but I want to say it was about $1,000 or $1,200. Um, between hiring the crew and paying the different um, 
paying the different fees to go through, I want to say it was about $1,200, uh, but I'm not confident on that. Um, I also have a question here. Um, did you consider desalinization a water maker? Um, no, we didn't get a water maker. We didn't because uh, the vessel had a 280 gallon uh, water capacity. Uh, water makers, they break um, and they require a lot of uh, power to run. Um, so our, our, really our goal was to minimize power reduction. We switched everything to LED lights. Again, we were turning the chart plotter off on the way across. Um, once, the, once the fridge went out, we didn't have to run the engine at all to produce power for the boat. Um, the power was, was coming through, um, through the solar. Uh, so the, the problem with the water maker is that it draws a lot of power and it is prone to breaking. Um, again, we spent four and a half months learning all the systems of the boat. We didn't know everything about it. So adding a water maker into that mix would have just been another thing to, to break. Uh, was it noisy, particularly below deck? No, we were not on a catamaran. Catamarans suck. <laughs> uh, just a personal, just a personal opinion. Um, the catamarans suffer, I think, as, as, uh, as they talked about it, from a lot of uh, water slapping underneath of the deck um, in between the two sponsons. We don't have that on, um, on a monohull. Pros and cons, there's an up and a down to everything. Like I said, big boat, less able to, to go into small places. No bikes, you have to walk more. Um, monohull versus catamaran. We didn't have the loud slapping. We were able to sail upwind a little bit better. I'm more familiar with monohull's um, sailing techniques, but we didn't have the stability. Um, and so that's what I was talking about when I talked about the twizzle rig versus the wing on wing. Um, a catamaran does not rock as much. You can probably put a drink down and not have to hold on to it. I I'm not kidding when I say when we were sailing directly downwind, if you put a drink on a table, it, it almost felt like the, the ocean was out to get you. It, someone would come up and just smack your drink off the table. <laughs> it, it, it felt like the ocean was constantly bullying you. In your bunk, you know, you just constant roll in the bunk. It, it got very agitating towards the end of the 30 days in the Pacific on a downwind. So wasn't loud, but th there are pros and cons to, to monohulls versus, uh, versus catamarans. What kind of people did we meet out in the islands? Um, French people don't like, well, and I don't want to overgeneralize here, they don't like outsiders who can't speak their language. Um, we, we experienced a lot of uh, uh, just different um, relations. And so we went, into, we went to pull into a marina. Yeah, I'll just give you an example. And we called over the radio. We said, hey, guys, do you have any berths available? And this is when we were getting in Tahiti. Um, and, and they said no. And so they, they sent us off. And while a boat came in behind us and they said, hey, do you guys have any berths available? And they, they did. But they were French. They were speaking English and French. Do you have any berths available? And the guy came back in French. And then they came back in French. And they let him in. It's just it, it, there's different situations like that where they, they really do want you to be able to speak or at least attempt to speak their language. Um, Tonga Dan. We also met Tonga Dan. We we're in uh, Tahiti. Tonga Dan is... Uh, uh, I don't know what to call him, an everyday vagabond, a, a, a gypsy, I don't know, awesome guy. He was at the marina that we ended up tying up at. He came down with a straw hat and he was looking for a ride on a boat from Tahiti to Tonga. His life story, he was an English school teacher. He had enough of the everyday life. Um, and so his goal was to get from England to Tonga, which we were going to Tonga, um, without any sort of public transportation. And so he, he came up to us and, and we said, well, how did you get to Tahiti? And he, he smacked his legs and he pointed at his face and he said, I got my legs and I got my smile. And that was it. <laughs> and he had been um, jumping on different people's boats all the way across. Uh, very cool guy. We weren't able to get him a ride. Obviously, we're professional delivery. We can't just take strangers on. There's liabilities. We were captains. Wanted to. Really cool guy. We did hang out with him for a bit. Um, met some guys in, in the Marquesas Islands that they were – uh, they were carving things out of wood and, and selling them to the people that came through. Those were some pretty cool people. Um, <sighs> Panama was pretty cool, the bartender. We spent a lot of time in Panama. Um, <laughs> how did you prepare for piracy? Did you have any uh, security issues and did Andrew spare small children? <laughs> um, no, uh, we did not have any issues with um, – with Andrew scaring small children. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's a very friendly face. Um, we did have an issue of piracy though. We were in Panama waiting to transit the canal 
we decided to um, trip over to the San Blas Islands, just a little bit more natural, less um, commercial port-like. Um, and the San Blas Islands are home to a native Indian population there. Um, and a native population maybe is, is a proper term. And we were anchored up after it took us 24, 36 hours to sail over there. We we're all pretty, pretty tired. So we all went to sleep. A dinghy was in the water tied up and we woke up and the dinghy was gone. Um, they, they had come up to the boat while we were on the boat. And again, we're speculating we don't have cameras, but we know how to tie a cleat itch, right? I mean, so, so somehow the dinghy had disappeared. Um, we did a little search for, we found it two islands away. Um, I swam up to shore and we didn't have another dinghy uh, to put in the water. So I jumped off the boat and swam up to shore to go take our dinghy back. And some guys came down from a, from a house. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, is this your dinghy? Yeah, you know, they, they spoke okay English. And we said, well, yeah. And, and the, you know, they said, well, you, you can buy it back. And we, well, what? And so we, we read afterward on, on noon site that this isn't uncommon. Um, they'll take dinghies. They'll take the outboard off the back of the dinghy. Um, it cost us $100 and six beers to get the dinghy back. Um, so piracy issues. I mean, the, the population there is, is suffering a lot. The Panamanian government and, and the, um, the native population don't get along. Um, when we went over there, there were um, military uh, at the, the check-in bases with full um, automatic rifles, just kind of asserting the, the Panamanian authority over that, that section of, uh, of land. So I can understand why they do it. Um, but yes, yeah, we did have the issue. We didn't, we didn't bring guns on board or anything like that. Um, if you made this trip again, would you do anything different? Yes, I would not do this trip again as a delivery. Um, we had to skip a lot of beautiful parts uh, of the Pacific. Um, we didn't go to Fiji. Uh, we skipped the Tuamotus. I would have loved to have spent more time in the Marquesas Islands. It's a number of islands there, very beautiful. Um, we, we were in a bit of a rush. Um, if I could do it differently, I probably would spend a little bit more time on the preparation, just outfitting the boat. Um, but that would come from, from doing trips, uh, short trips, like to the Bahamas and back, just to kind of see um, what's going to break, just, just to be a little more prepared, um, have more spare parts available if I was going to do the trip again. And I think that's all the questions I have on here. Just, uh, Sam, just a question. Um, uh, in terms of the, the crew on the boat, uh, were there kind of special skills that anyone had or uh, special tasks that they were given? And I, I don't know if you want to ask anything specific of Andrew, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Andrew was a great help to have on board. Andrew did the trip from us from Annapolis to uh, Turks and Caicos. Unfortunately, the, the time delays um, made it so he had to, he had to go back to work. Um, the, the, the special skill set I, I mentioned a little bit, um, ben, ben had a lot of experience with, um, with maintenance on boats. Um, he'd been doing some fiberglass work. Um, Fred, Fred really had the ultimate um, knowledge set on, on maintenance, and, and that was really where the, the deficit was. So I think those stood out more in skill sets that they had that maybe I didn't. Um, all of my time, I had kind of been maybe a little bit foolish to say that, you know, leave all of those other parts of sailing behind. I love the rainbow and its simplicity. You know, give me a set of sails, give me a main sheet, give me a boom bang. I don't want a spinnaker. I don't want a motor. I don't want a GPS, you know, just keep it simple. And so because of that, I had, I had lacked a lot in, in systems um, and, and the electronic side of things. Uh, we had a number of problems that I didn't cover because the complexity would be too high. I think I already went into an, an hour worth of it. Um, but where the batteries had wiring issues because, you know, there was, it wasn't wired upright or a wire was having too much um, resistance or, you know, the corrosion of wiring. So there's a lot that I didn't have in, in the form of um, maintenance, mechanical, uh, electronics that, that, you know, we, we had in, in other parts, but maybe not enough of. Um, Andrew, again, Andrew had a lot of that, that same type of, of maintenance experience. He was very helpful when we had to get... Um, when we had to get the motors running again, things like that. And he, he was able to, to get down there. He also has really long arms, so reaching into those, those small arms. Um, how about the three shift watch? Could you sustain that on a long voyage? We, we did sustain that on a long voyage. So we did um, three on, three off nonstop. It was 24 hours. Um, so sorry, three on, six off. Um, it was nonstop 24 hours. It, it was sustainable. Um, it was, it, it would take probably two days to get into the routine where you would be able to nap in the middle of the day, which is, is weird. 
Um, it, it would take about three days to get back on that schedule. But once you were on the schedule, it, it was it was very sustainable. You, you would sleep for three or four hours at a time. You know, you use the other hour or two to, to make a meal or, or shower with a bucket, which was really how we showered, a cloth in a bucket. Um, it, when I got back, it was actually very difficult to, to adjust to, to normal um, work schedules, which is, you know, an eight or 12 hour day and, and you know, the, the, and an overnight. I, I woke up several times kind of in a, in a panic because I couldn't figure out why the boat wasn't moving. I, I couldn't figure out why there were lights outside and it was like the middle of the night. I, I'd get up at, at two or three in the morning, get up for two or three hours and have a small meal and go back to bed. And then it was, it was very difficult to get back to normal. Um, but yeah, three on six off is, is very sustainable. It's not sustainable with just two people. Um, two people sailing crews on deliveries, uh, you're going to wear yourself out very quickly. If someone gets hurt, you don't have a backup. Um, so, so three is sustainable Four when we had Andrew on, that was awesome. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, that was sustainable. Uh, what was your favorite meal? <laughs> You know, canned spam is not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> After a little while, you get used to it. So uh, we, we made a number of different concoctions with spam. Um, I, I would say I really enjoyed the outside of the fresh fish, which obviously has a, a huge advantage over the rest of it, mixing the fish in like fish tacos with, with rice and corn and black beans and, and salsa. That was really good. Um, but when it came down to the, the limited food that you might have on a delivery, um, canned spam, rice, black beans, and corn, uh, was awesome with a little bit of ranch dressing. Very, very good. That was probably one of my favorites. Ranch dressing seems a little bit weird. Also eggs. Um, eggs in America, you get them, they have to be refrigerated. And that's because of the way that we wash them. Our food safety regulations here, you have to wash the eggs. Nowhere else that we went did that. Um, so eggs that we got in other countries didn't have to be refrigerated. Great, since we lost our fridge. Um, so eggs were another fresh meal that, that was very enjoyable, making a lot of, um, you couldn't have a lot of bread for a long time. Bread goes moldy. Tortillas stay a little longer. Um, making uh, egg, egg and cheese burritos and, and different things like that went while we had cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, would you raise the S and S? Absolutely. I, it, it's an incredibly well-rounded boat. Um, the versatility in your sail plan is um is huge you have this vinegar you have the downwind capacity it sailed upwind like a dream i was amazed it pointed very well um sparksman and stevens just did a great job designing boats that could race and also um, really hold up for the long distance cruising really i mean i would encourage you guys if you want to this is a trip that's doable for everybody um yes i spent a long time prior to this trip sailing um, and and learning and yes I didn't know everything when I went um, but it, it's something that you can do there's a ton of resources at the sailing school um, between Andrew Mo, um, Ryan there's there's all kinds of resources at the sailing school they post all kinds of seminars like this watch the seminars go out sailing as much as possible get a feel for it, it it's definitely doable uh, so, in speaking of then, what what would be your your next uh, dream trip then? I, I got to finish the circle. Um, so, I mean, I've done I've done about halfway uh, Annapolis to Australia. I'd love to get from from Australia or at least that um, that longitude back to back to Annapolis. Um, there, there's a, a possibility for a delivery from. Um, from Japan to Annapolis, you know, I've, I've had that in the back of my, but deliveries like this take a long time. I obviously don't have the money to purchase a, to purchase a cruising vessel of, of, uh, of that capacity. So, but I, I got to finish the loop. That's, uh, that's pretty exciting then. Uh, well, I wish you luck with that. I want to say, I thought it's great talk. I did get a, a big kick out of seeing the kids in the beginning and kind of the, uh, the uh, underlying theme in terms of, uh, bringing the, uh, the football back to Australia. It's the kind of fitting, you know, Sam was the director of kinship uh, for a couple of years and, and great. And so it still shows forth with uh, that. But um, so, so thank you very much for that. Uh, as Sam mentioned, uh, and I had uh, stated early in the presentation that um, the, the sailing school is open for certain activities, uh, certainly for Kiobo club members and, uh, Rainbow Rentals, um, and not necessarily the SNS that uh, Sam was on, but 
uh, a lot of fun. So we encourage you to uh, to come down. We also uh, will be posting um, Sam's trip, and so we uh, uh, encourage you to tell all your friends about it and uh, then look for it. And then um, two weeks hence, we'll have another uh, seriously fun topic, and I uh, hope you'll all join us for that. So anyway, everyone, thank you. Rick, if I may, um, if you guys reach out to the Salem School, if you have more questions on this, um, the Salem School knows how to get in touch with me. Um, comment through their Facebook page. There's also a Salem Swanee page. So um, if you guys have more questions after this or after it's posted, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to the Salem School. They might be able to help or, or to me. Beautiful. Thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks, Rick. Bye. Bye. Bye.